again, I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, and I was blessed to have a mom who loved the Lord. Uh, if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here for a couple reasons. If it weren't for her, I, she really was the one who, who made sure that I was in church as a young boy, and, and uh, she was the one that really modeled Christ for me. Yep, the children can go down to Sunday school. And so she's the one that modeled Christ for me. And uh, so my mom was one who was instrumental. My dad as well, but my mom really was instrumental in, in uh, helping me have a desire to go to church and write through the gospel and come to know Christ. I'm also here today because she was the one who spared me from a lot of the hidings that I should have gotten. She was the one that tried to talk my dad out of beating me like he wanted to, and I deserve. And so I'm here today, maybe she did too, because my mom intervened. But what an important thing it is for godly mothers. I, I was privileged also to watch my wife as she raised our children and uh, to see a godly mom in action for a second time. Uh, what a joy it is. And what an important role, as Mike said already, uh, for mothers. The message I have today really isn't a Mother's Day message, but there's going to be some things that certainly apply to mothers as well as all of us. And the message is today, you see the title, Redeeming the Time. Obviously with mothers, it is a short time that we really have with our kids, isn't it? Little Zane is here right now and they're holding him, but boy, if the Lord tarries, it won't be long until he's out on his own. It seems like it happens in an instant. You know what? It's not unlike us as Christians. What we're going to see today is we only have a limited amount of time to do what God's asked us to do, to do what he's called us to do. And before we know it, it's over. As a matter of fact, for us as Christians in the church, it could be over today. It could be raptured out of here, and that's our joy, and that's our hope, that Jesus would come in the clouds and take us home. A couple weeks ago, I preached on Romans chapter 12, and I don't know if it's because I'm OCD or... Or not, but I like to go with chapter 13 today. But I think it's, it, it really, chapter 13 is a continuation of what chapter 12 was. Um, one of the things we hear all the time is, is true biblical Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship, right? And, and we would agree with that. It's not a religion, but a relationship. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul began to paint this picture after he challenged the believers in the church of Rome. He challenged them to... to Present their bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. He challenged them not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their mind, that they may prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God. And so Paul challenged them with that. But then he began to paint a picture of what this new life in Christ looks like. He said he, he listened to some spiritual gifts that believers have. And some believers are teachers. Some, uh, you know, and he, and he gave those gifts of what we have. So all of us believers, we learned a couple weeks ago, are given a spiritual gift by God to serve. Some of you will discover that maybe as you take the teacher training coming up on Saturday, maybe God will show you that you have the gift of teaching children. So we saw those gifts. And then we also saw, he began to continue to show them how they should relate to each other. And how they should relate in the world. Now, as we go to chapter 13, we're going to see the same thing. Paul's going to continue to lead us in, in what this relationship looks like. He's first going to talk about what it looks like in our relationship to how we relate to our government. What's our role and responsibility as believers when it comes to government? And then he's going to talk about the main thing, the goal, the love that we need to have for each other. And that's the, the, the thing that, that shows us as Christians more than anything else. And then he's going to talk a little bit about Oh, and by the way, yes, we only have a short time to do this. So we're going to see that in Romans chapter 13. You know, one day when we get to heaven, guys, we're not going to need to work in our relationship with God. We're not going to need to work in our relationship with others because when we get to heaven, it's going to be perfect. Amen. We'll be without sin. But one of the ways we can glorify God here today is by working on our relationship with Him, by being in His Word, by getting to know Him. And then working on a relationship with others. You know, a lost world watches, by the way, how we relate to one another. They watch how we relate to them. And we're going to see today, also they watch how we relate as we obey our government. Our testimony and all these things is so important as we seek to lead others and help point others to Christ. 
So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 13. It's only 14 verses, but some of you have 12 pages of notes. So I'll be praying for you guys. I hope you had coffee this morning. I'm just looking at it this morning. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you again. As we've already said, Lord, we thank you for our mothers. We thank you, Lord, for those who you've saved and born again, who's, who are raising their children up to love you and to, to come to know you as their Savior. And Lord, we pray you would give each of our moms a, a strong heart, give them a love that surpasses everything, first of all, for you, secondly, for, for their children and for everyone else, and then thirdly, for themselves. And Father, we pray that you continue to use them in a mighty way. Thank you, God, for your perfect plan of husband and wife in marriage and, and what it means. And when that is done right, the home glorifies you and those folks know you as their Savior. So, Father, now we also look at your word this morning. And, Lord, I pray, first of all, that you would give me wisdom as I, I attempt to, to teach what you have to share with us, with us today. And, Father, I pray you would open all of our hearts as we read your word, as we discuss it and think about what it means. And, Father, you would use it to indeed transform us to become more like Christ. Father, we ask you to guide us today. We ask you to be glorified in all that we say, all that we do, all that we're thinking. Then, Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, we'll leave not only with new knowledge, but with a new heart, ready to serve you in a new way, so others can know you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, 14 verses in Romans chapter 13, and verses 1 to 7 take a look at how we relate to government and how we should relate as believers. And verses 8 to 10 speaks of our relationship with people as a whole. And verses 11 to 13 speak of the urgency for our service for Christ and that our focus should be on eternity and on the promises and plan of God. And then verse 14, one of the reasons that the Lord laid on my heart to preach chapter 13 he shows us what we should look like doing it. So let's start off by looking at verses 1 to 7 in Romans chapter 13. I'm going to be uh, reading out of the Bible version I grew up with, so I apologize. I, I, I'm used to the New King James, and that's just what I grew up with, so that's what I'm going to be reading out of uh, this morning. <coughs> Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Let every soul be subject to government authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So first of all, we're to be subject to our government, meaning we're to submit to it, we're to obey it. Then verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not, um, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, also you pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Tax to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. This week, obviously, as, as uh, Brother David already talked about, this week our focus has been on that government, hasn't it? Not only here, but already in the states, they're already focused on the 2020 elections. Half the country wants to get rid of the president, the other half wants to keep the president, and it's, we're already looking forward to those things and talking about them. I think it's a sad thing for both of our countries that most of the people in this land and in the states are putting their faith and their trust in their government instead of the Lord. Even churches in America, they have what's called the religious right. They're involved in politics, and they seem to think that somehow by legislating morality, that's going to change the country. The church has lost its way, but not by legislating morality changes the country. It's by going to one person at a time and sharing the gospel. And when they get saved, you change the country one person at a time. Government can't change this world. Only God can through the power of the gospel of the Holy Spirit. And so, but Paul does give here in this chapter, he gives us what should we be doing with government? Obviously, it doesn't say anywhere that we should put our hope in our government. It doesn't say that. But it does say we have a responsibility to submit to the authority. And he gives three basic reasons. The first is because it's right. 
God invented the government that we have. He's the one that instituted it. We know that, uh, if you know us at all about faith fellowship, we are a dispensational church. We believe that God operates in different ways through different times, and it's a response to the people's failure in the previous dispensation. For example, Adam and Eve were in the dispensation of innocence. They lived in the Garden of Eden with no sin. Well, then they failed that. And then they were now in the dispensation of conscience. They knew right from wrong. But they failed that as well. And Cain murdered his brother Abel. And so then God instituted the dispensation of government. He put government in place for the sole purpose of avenging a murderer. So if someone murders someone, God says they must be put to death. And obviously there had to be people in power to make those decisions. And so this idea of government is not a new one. It's one that was instituted by God. Now we are in a different dispensation of grace, but yet government still plays a role in our society. So we see here in verse 1 that our governments are in general are put in place by God. Therefore, they deserve respect and submission. Secondly, Paul says that believers are to submit because it's wise. He gives you in these verses, he gives you the idea of, well, you know, if you, if you obey, you don't have to be afraid of your government. How many people here today, if they find out that they're going to be audited by SARS, how many people are here? Oh, I saw them out there. Or when some of you go, oh, I hope they don't find what I did. For some reason, it seems, and in the United States as well, it seems to be okay to cheat the government. But Paul says no here. We're not to do that. We're to, we're to submit to them. We're to be fearful if we go against what they say. So he says, and if you do what's right, you don't have to be afraid. It's kind of like when we drive. You know, If we're going the right speed limit, we don't have to slam on the brake and slow down before the camera. Not that I'm speaking by experience. <laughs> I meant riding with Philip. <laughs> So we, but we don't have to be afraid of that punishment. And so he says, first of all, it's okay to submit to your government. It's your, it's your first of all, your, your right. It's right. It's right to do. Secondly, it's smart. Because if you disobey your government, you're going to face the consequences. And then thirdly, he says, because it's fair. Paul seems to be indicating that the government, and again, as David prayed, if it's done right, the government should be working for us. So when we pay our taxes... Rather than it going to a corrupt government, which pockets their, the money and they build big houses for themselves, our taxes are supposed to be, as God would have submitted it to be, to help pay roads, to take care of, you know, do the things that, that need to be for the whole good of the country. I don't believe it was so much to take care of people, though, because I think that was the job of the church that the church failed to do. Welfare is only in existence because the church doesn't do what it's supposed to do by giving to people and helping people. And then he talks about the idea of because of our conscience. You know, we, we all have a conscience. And those of us who are born again also have the Holy Spirit, which leads us and convicts us of sin. And so we're, we're obey the government because of that as well. Now, any person can obey the government out of fear of punishment. But we as Christians ought to do it because it's right, because God has told us to do it. Just like showing the Lord, I don't believe any of us should do it out of fear. We do it out of love because it's right. And it's the same thing as we obey what, what Paul has listed in, in Romans chapter 13. Now, the question that always comes up when I teach this is, well, what if the government asks you to do something that's not right? Then what do you do? Do you move to Australia? No. What do we do then? Well, we have a good picture of it in Acts chapter 5. I just want to read a couple verses quickly. And that's one of the reasons why I have 12 verses, because I put the verses on paper in a bigger print, because I'm getting old and I need to see it. But here's what it says in Acts chapter 5. We have this picture of, of what the government was in, in trying to impose on the apostles. It says that the captain uh, went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. Talking about bringing the uh, disciples before them. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council, the government. And the high priest asked them, say, did we not strictly command you to teach in his name, not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine um, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and other apostles answered him and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You hear that? We ought to obey God rather than men. 
The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So Peter and the apostles give us a picture. If the government says don't do something that God said to do, we're okay to obey God's word and not the government. You know, God tarries and doesn't take the church home. I believe that maybe someday here in South Africa and someday in America that they're going to forbid us from preaching the gospel. They're already making us not be able to speak out against homosexuality. They're already saying that that's hate speech. They're already starting to try to make things be toned down. And it's only a matter of time before they're going to say the gospel's hate speech. In fact, some are already saying that. And so maybe they're going to be a government selected and put in power that are going to say don't. And yes, God does allow that to happen as well. You know, there's a saying, I don't know if it's always true, but there's a saying that God gives us the government we deserve. And uh, sometimes I think that that's true. I don't know that it's 100% true, but sometimes it is. But, you know, think about that. Most of us in the church aren't faithful to share the gospel now when we're free to do so. What are we going to do if it comes to the place where we're told we can't? Do we think we're going to be any different? Probably not. And so we need to be praying. And we're going to see here in a little bit in this next section about what should be the motive for us doing that. But what's the remedy? If we're not sharing the gospel now, and maybe we're told by our government later that we can't do it, what's the remedy? Well, Paul gives us that in the next section of verses, verses 8 to 10. He says, first of all, owe, one, owe, uh, uh, owe no one anything except to love one another. <clears throat> For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. Love does, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So what should love look like? Well, we see, first of all, that we're not going to sin against each other if, if we're treating our neighbor in love. It's very difficult to say you love your neighbor while you steal his lawnmower. It's very difficult to say you love your neighbor when you're uh, having an adulterous relationship with them. It's very difficult to say you love your neighbor while you, you hate the fact that they have a nicer house than you. You know, it's very difficult to say you love your neighbor. Oh, by the way, if he says any other commandment here, we're told to go and share the gospel. It's very difficult to say you love your neighbor if you're not sharing Christ. We see a picture of what that love looks like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, don't we? The chapter, love chapter, verses 4 to 7. I won't read the whole chapter, but he says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not speak to its own. Does not provoke. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, this type of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, really, Paul, I believe, is talking about what this love should look like between us as believers in the church. And one of the ways that we can show the world that we're Jesus' disciples is by our love for one another. We've talked about that quite a bit. But you know, guys, if, if this is the only type of love that we exhibit, and even this type of love that we show to a lost world, and we don't take the gospel to them, we're only doing the social gospel. Some churches do. They love, they give, they do all those things, but then they don't share the gospel. And that's not love. You know, one of the things I always tell the youth is, is let's say I discovered a cure for AIDS. But then I decided that I wasn't going to share it with anybody. It wasn't the right time. Maybe I wanted to get more money. Maybe whatever the reason you would say, if you had that, you are such a cruel, unloving person to withhold that cure for so many who need it. And yet we have the perfect cure for sin and death, and we keep it inside and don't share it with anybody. And guys, if that's us, and we have the audacity to say that we love people, 
we have to check our love. But you may say, but Pastor Jim, yeah, I love them, but I'm afraid. Well, you mothers out there, how many of you had to tell your children difficult things because you loved them? Things that you protected them from, things that you warned them about. Didn't make things happy sometimes. Sometimes it made the family upset. Sometimes it made the kids upset. Sometimes it made the dad upset. But yet you knew what was right because you loved your children and you said, this is good for them and I must do it. The same thing applies to us as Christians. We say we love people, even if we do all the things that Paul mentions here in Romans 13 or in 1 Corinthians 13, and we don't share the gospel, that love is kind of hollow, it's kind of empty. Because we're doing all the easy things, but not doing the thing that matters most, and that is sharing with them the hope of eternal life of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel. To say, but I'm afraid. I, I want to read, I just got a new book. I like Ray Comfort, and he has a new book, and I forget the name of it now. It's called something about, it's an apologetic book. It's a brand, a brand new one that he has. And in the first chapter, maybe it's the introduction, he has this. He said, you're in a friend's house, sitting by a swimming pool on a hot day. You've been hesitant to dive in because it's not a heated pool. And you know that the water, when you hit the water, your flesh is going to feel it. You find yourself standing on the pool's edge and looking at the cold water. Your friends call out to you that the water is fine and encourage you to dive in. And the longer you stand there, the harder it becomes. The idea here is he's talking about you, you can anticipate this cold water hitting you. We've all, we've all been there. Then he says, though, now consider a second scenario of the same scene. You are seated by a pool and you see your toddler run to the water's edge, fall into the swimming pool and sink to the bottom. Do you think about the cold water? Not for a second. Do you need the coasting of your friends? Of course not. You immediately dive in and grab that precious child. How did you overcome fear? The answer is simple, love. Your love for your child immediately dealt with your frivolous concern about the cold water. The key to reaching those who are perishing in their sins is love, because it casts out all fear. If you're afraid to share your faith, don't pray for less fear. Pray for more love. That's what's missing. And that thought calls out to modern Christendom. They see the child drowning and deliberately busy themselves, holding towels and preparing drinks. The Bible uses an even more fearful picture when it paints the fate of the lost. It doesn't use water, it uses fire. And on some have compassion, making distinction, but others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Quotes Jude 22 and 23. And he notices, notice the presence of love in this verse. When it says, and on some have compassion. Love cannot sit in its passivity. It must take action. We as Christians are commanded this year, the gospel, we're commanded to love people. And in this, we do need a supernatural love given to us from God to do it. But when? Do I have to do it now? Am I busy? I'm busy at work right now. My life is really hard. Um, my neighbors aren't ready yet. When are we going to do what we're supposed to do? Well, you hear the saying, right? There's no time like the present. Or don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Well, Paul here in the next couple of verses adds a third saying. In my Jim Miller version, this is by the way. Paul adds another idea to the mix. He is saying that we may not have a tomorrow. Do what we should be doing today. Let's take a look at the next section, Romans chapter 13, 11 to 13. Starting in verse 11, he says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Paul's saying, listen, now's the time. Church, don't be sleepy. So many of us in the church, not just here, but in the evangelical churches across the globe, are sleepwalking, not sharing the gospel. They're not thinking about Jesus could come any moment in the class. And some don't even believe it. Don't believe in a rapture. But we do. We're to be watching, waiting for that. Not sleepwalking. Because our salvation, what he's talking about there is not our salvation from sin, but the outcome of our salvation. The, the final outcome of being with Jesus in glory, some of the songs we sang this morning, is at hand. He says that the night is far spent and the day 
is at hand. We're going to talk about what that day he's talking about is. He said, the day is at hand, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, kind of like our memory verses this morning, right? And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly. properly. In other words, let us have a right relationship with God and others. As in the day, not in revelry and in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. What he's saying there is don't be busy doing the things of the world. Again, like our memory verses this morning. Well, what's the day that Paul's talking about here in verse 12? Well, we talked about that day. We read about that day this morning in our scripture passage. Before we get to the day of the Lord and what I believe Paul's talking about here, before we get to the day of the Lord in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to take a look at what happens before that in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. That's the next prophetic event that you and I as believers are looking forward to. And that's the rapture. He says in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, But I don't want you to be here, brother, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Just thinking about Pastor Cal's mom's funeral. It was a difficult thing to say goodbye. But yet for the church, there still was a hope and a joy and a comfort because we know where she is. And we know that we'll see her one day. All of us who have loved ones who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and who have um, passed away, I like to say, as my dad used to say, graduated to heaven, we have a hope. And that's what he's saying here. Don't act like that. Verse 14, it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have passed away. I'm not talking about Philip sleeping. But those who passed away. Sleep is an Old Testament euthanism, really, for death. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I remember our pastor used to say, if you read this, he would stop and then go, are you listening? Because maybe, just maybe, we'll hear the trumpet. You know, and, and he used to say that, he used to say all the time, perhaps today this can happen. Mm -hmm. Then verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What a glorious reunion it will be. Usually when Philip and I, when he comes to the house and picks up the combi, we'll say, see you tomorrow. But then we'll say, unless we see you in the air first day. And what a glorious truth that is. But then he says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the event that we're talking about here is the rapture. And people who don't believe in a rapture will first of all tell you, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. They're right, it's not. But the word that we use rapture for means caught up. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, that those who are alive are be caught up together. That's what the word rapture means, to be caught up. And so the rapture is a very... Biblical teaching, even though the word rapture is not in our Bibles. And so we take a look at this, and that's the next thing we have to be looking forward to. And then in verse 18, he says something very interesting when he says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, you and I, as believers, can comfort one another with those words. Now, if there's believers who are living from the world, though, and they're not really focused on Christ, some believers are comforted with those words. I've heard some always say, but I would like to get married first. I would like to have my first child. I would like to see my grandkids. You know, then, the word we're told to, to be watchful, be waiting. But certainly those who don't know Christ as their Savior aren't going to be comforted by these words. Because nobody likes to be left behind. I remember as a little kid being left behind in the mall. It wasn't a happy thing. And so we have this idea of rapture coming. God is going to take his church from the earth. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if that happens right now, you'll be maybe the only one sitting here. The rest of us will be gone. The good thing is you'll have a lot of cars that you can pick from. But the bad thing is, is you'll be left behind. And so, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to first challenge you before we finish this message this morning. 
to ask yourself, do I know Jesus Christ? Am I sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today, that I would wake up in glory? Or if Jesus were to come in the clouds right now, that I would be caught? Am I sure of that? If you're here today and you say, no, I'm not sure, then the first thing you need to do is admit to God you're a sinner, right? Romans 3.23 says, for, for all have sinned. <coughs> That's for the Lord of God. You have to admit it that you're a sinner. Not just admit it. You have to admit it and want to repent. You want to change it. You, you see your sin in your life and you hate it. Then it says that punishment for sin is death. Romans 6.23, right? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, the first thing you have to realize is you're a sinner. You need Jesus because your punishment is death. And if you die in your sins, you'll live in eternity separated from God forever and ever fire. It's not Pastor Jim saying that or Pastor Philip, it's God saying that. Jesus talked a lot more about hell in the New Testament than he talked about heaven. Then, but then you're ready for the good news. If you're here today and say, yeah, I'm a sinner, and I, and I know that if God were to punish me today, I deserve it. But then the good news is... You don't have to take the punishment. Romans 5 8, right? God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. If you're here today, you've never trusted in Christ. Good news, Jesus paid your penalty for you. And it's a free gift. Ephesians 2 8 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus died for you and rose again. And it's not of yourselves, it's not religion or works, lest any man should fall. And then Romans 10, 13 says, if you believe that, Paul says that actually before verse 13, he says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Then in verse 13, he says, if you do that, then whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're here today and you were to be fearful that you'd be the one sitting here if that rapture we just read about would happen, please don't be here today without talking to Pastor Philip or myself or right now. Because maybe we won't get to finish the message. Maybe the rapture will come. Right now, where you're sitting, just call on Jesus to save you. You don't have to be in a special place. You don't have to be with other people. You can open up your heart to God right now. And say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I believe that Jesus died for me. Please, give up my heart and save me. Be my Lord and Savior. And he'll save you today. And that way, you'll be certain that the rapture will come in the next 10 minutes. You'll be going with us. And someone else will get all the cars. But that's okay. We'll leave them today. We'll leave them here. If being left behind is scary, then what's next? Well, we've read about it in chapter 5. This is the day of the Lord now that Paul talked about in Romans 13. He says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. This isn't talking about the rapture. Paul talked about the rapture before. This is now talking about after the rapture. When the tribulation starts. And we're going to know that, for example, the Antichrist is going to come at that time. He's going to come to power. Maybe he's here now. We don't know. He's going to come to power and he's going to seem to be in control of everything. He's going to go peace and safety. I don't know how we're going to explain, you know, all the Christians being gone and the price of aliens or something like that. But he says, here, for yourselves are perfectly, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. That's labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brother, are not of the darkness. So this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Here again in this passage, we're told not to sleep. We're told to be busy, awake, watching, waiting. We're not to sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the red breastplate of faith and love. There is again the love of need. And as a helmet of hope and salvation, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. We see in this passage, too, the guarantee or the hope that we're not going to have to face that wrath to come in this tribulation. It says here um, in verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. That's why that tribulation or the rapture that happens first is going to take us out. We're not going to be here during the tribulation. We don't have to worry about it as born again believers. But those in our family, those are neighbors, those who are co-workers who don't know Jesus Christ, who are left behind, 
today are going to be through this difficult time. And you see it, and we don't have time today, um, so I'm going to spare you some of my notes. That's what's going to happen when we see through Revelation chapter 4, really till the end of the book, of talking about what happens. The wrath of God is poured out. The terrible time after that first three and a half years of the tribulation period, what happens next is just things go bad. And then the Antichrist is defeated, the battle of Armageddon. And then Jesus comes and sets up his thousand year reign. Then after the thousand year reign comes, Satan, who's been bound, is going to be loosed, and he's going to somehow get people who live with Jesus for a thousand years somehow to get them to revolt and try to take over. <coughs> Jesus is going to defeat him one last time. Satan's going to be defeated forever. You're going to have him cast in the lake of fire. You're going to have a great white throne judgment. Those who didn't trust in Christ are going to be told. Their name's not written in the book of life, and now you're cast into the lake of fire forever, which is the second day. That's what's going to happen. And yet we say we love people, and we don't tell them. We don't warn them because we're afraid. Well, you read the illustration that fear is, is no excuse. It's not fear. We don't love them enough to tell them. It's not fear. Because we love them enough we would do enough to tell them. We as believers must believe what God's word says. If we really believe that the rapture can happen at any moment, then the terrible tribulations will follow. We must be busy. We must do what Paul says in our passage today in Romans. He says again in verse 12 of Romans 13, back in our passage, he says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the rapture could happen at any moment? Yes. Because we can say we do, but what we do today and, and each day after that shows whether we really believe it or not. Do we really believe that our neighbor who needs to hear Christ might not have us around tomorrow? We might be gone. And yet we say, well, we'll get around to it. I'm going to spill three and a half years of friendship evangelism. None of them have shared It's not biblical. Therefore, let us cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I believe this armor of light is, is, is showing the world that we're different, right? What Paul talked about, how we submit to government and how we love each other and how we love our neighbor. Putting on that. And let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust. In other words, don't be living like the world and don't not be in strife and envy. We need to cast off the things of the world and be busy sharing the gospel with others while there's still time. If so, if we believe it, let's act like it. We must pray for love so that our love for others will cast out the fear of sharing the gospel. We must realize our time may be cut short. We must be busy redeeming the time God has given us before it's too late. Paul writes this to the church of Colossae in Colossians chapter 4. He says, starting in verses 5 and 6, he says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. How do you walk in wisdom? Well, you show by what we looked at in Romans 12 and Romans 13. You show that by your new light in Christ. Here in Romans 13, you show we walk in wisdom by being different. We submit to government. We don't cheat in our taxes. We love our neighbor. We don't steal. We don't do those things. You see, and you're going to take that wisdom, that godly living, Christ living, because Christ is the wisdom of God, as it says in Corinthians. We take that to a lost world who are outside. And he says, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Guys, this morning, if you sat through that, it took me two minutes to share the gospel, didn't it? Maybe longer. But if you just take the time and read verses and write them down, you can have wisdom to be able to, how to answer those who are outside. You don't need to be a theological uh, student to share the gospel. The moment you're saved, you know enough. To share Christ. Remember the blind man when they asked him, who, who healed you? What did he do? He says, all I know is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> and for us to share the gospel, all I know is I was this old rotten guy before, but now I'm born again in Jesus Christ because I was dying of my sins and he saved me. And let me tell you about Jesus. That's all. You don't have to be smart. You have to be smart. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, when you talk about teaching the children, boy, if God can use me, he can use anybody. Okay? Then let's look at our last verses we close. My wife always warned me about saying we close, and then they go on for another 10 minutes. <laughs> so listen closely, and, and you can tell me later if I'm closing or not, okay? 
Verse 14. I think this is the last one verse. He said, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill his lust. As we as believers are to put on our what's it look like? Well, we can study the life of Jesus and see what it looks like. A couple of passages. One of my favorite, Philippians chapter 2, right? Which verses 5 and 8, where Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being made the form of God, did not consider a robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, he didn't flaunt himself. But he took the form of a bondservant. How can we put on Christ? Serve others. Be humble. And coming in the likeness of man, being found in the appearances of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Didn't Paul just talk about don't be like the people in darkness? Don't be drunk? Don't be. Now, Jesus couldn't be those things, but he was obedient even to the point of death. He knew what his plan was. He knew what from eternity past, he knew what he had to do, and he was obedient to do it. If we're going to be put on Jesus, we'll have that mindset. And in Luke chapter 19, verses 10 and 41, we see this. But the, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If we're going to put on Jesus, we're going to seek and save those who are lost. Verse 41 says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. If we're going to put on Jesus, we're not going to complain about our unsaved neighbors who played music all night last night and, and we couldn't sleep. Instead, we're going to weep over them and pray, how can they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior? i got to work on that one, guys. It's so easy to complain about the lost and what they do. But as my pastor always said, look at that. They're done saved. He says, instead of complaining about them, pray for them and take the gospel to them. That's what Jesus did. He wept over Jerusalem. If we're going to put on Jesus, we're going to care what he cares about. Jesus chapter 4 says this, starting in verse 17. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding dark, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over illusions to work all uncleanness with greediness. And what he says in verse 20, but you have not learned so in Christ. That I am Christ. You have not learned so in Christ. If indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man. Remember we talked about in Romans 12, if you're truly born again, life begins at conception. The moment you're saved, new life happens. If you said a prayer and nothing changed, you better check it. And pray and say, God is saved. He said, concerning the former conduct of the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man. What he's saying is, again, put on Christ, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. First thing I want to ask this morning is I all like to finish messages with questions. Have you put on Christ? First of all, do you know him? Are you born again? I hope that if you didn't, if you pray today before the before we got here, I hope you've already prayed and trusted in Christ as your Savior. If you're not, today's the day of salvation. But for us who know Christ, have we put him on? Do people see Jesus when they look at us? It wasn't Gandhi said, I would maybe follow Christians if I could find one that acted like Christ. <coughs> Do we have a mindset of Jesus that we read about in Philippians 2? Do we care about what he cares about? And do others see the new man when they look at us? Or in other words, do they see Christ in us? So how is our relationship with our government? As we learn in the first seven verses, are we submitting as we are? How is our relationship with the world? Do we love others as we are? And how is our sense of urgency as we look at the lost around us? Are we redeeming the time? Or do we think we have a lot more than what we really have? Do we really believe that it could be now? Have we put on Christ? Do others see him in you? And more importantly, is anyone here that doesn't know him, do you know him? Guys, the love that we're supposed to have, and not care enough to share the gospel, it's interesting. It's not unlike a love that God the mother has for her children. She'll do anything to protect her children. And guys, we should do anything in our power by the 
help of God through His grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we should be busy sharing the gospel. Because 